Hello. Hello. Have we started again? We haven't started at all. What a silly bunt. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. I'll swallow your soul! And Big Anklevich. Come get some. Como está? Mabuti! Welcome! Welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome to the Dune Thief Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 99. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. Thanks for joining us. That's right. Today we've got a great story for you. It's called Spider Hunt. Dude. By Kenneth Yu. I what? Oh, he must get that a lot. Probably not, because Kenneth Yu is a writer from the Philippines. Ooh. His work has seen print in his country's various publications, including the Philippine e-zines Usok, Best of Philippine Speculative Fiction 2009, and in the print anthologies Philippine Speculative Fiction 4, 5, and 6. Whoa. One of his stories also placed third in the Neil Gaiman-sponsored Philippine Graphic Fiction Awards. Neil Gaiman, huh? Pretty cool, huh? Elsewhere, his stories have been accepted in The Town Drunk, Alien Skin, Mm. and Innsmouth Free Press, with another forthcoming in the print anthology DOA from Bloodbound Books. Well, this guy has taken great pains to make me feel worthless, just like my dad. (laughs) Yeah, he also won Fantasy Magazine's 2009 Halloween Flash Fiction Contest. You're just boasting now. And in addition to being on our show, he has another podcast at Pakingan Pilipinas. Ah, Which you're guessing is a Filipino podcast? Filipino, yes. And he has another one due out at Pseudopod. You're fudging kidding me. Oh, he's got good stuff. So he's just slumming it with us. (laughs) Yeah, you'll understand when you hear the story. Spider Hunt was originally published in the e-zine Aurora Wolf. And will be printed in an anthology, Aurora Wolf 3, Aurora of the Sun, due out very soon. Today's episode was produced by Brian Lincoln. And there's sound effects and music, and you can check out the links to those things in the show notes. Mabuti! Spider Hunt by Kenneth Yu. Leighton, still as stone, pressed back against the tree trunk and squinted. The rising sun shimmered through the gray, cloud-wrapped mountains on the horizon, an expanding line of light against night's end. With growing illumination, it sent its dawn rays forth, striking the boy hunter full on the face. Leighton stayed focused, not noticing how the darkness of the sky dissipated with morning's arrival, not minding the crystalline dewdrops dangling on his prey's wide web, not seeing the way they captured and refracted the early light, transforming themselves into a million miniature prisms and sending a slow, revolving dance of rainbow gems dappling across the grass of the forest floor. Leighton stayed as motionless as the tree he hid behind. The sun broke free from the mountain's grasp like an escaping bubble and brought with it complete daylight and a sudden rise in birdsong. A slight breeze blew and sent the web to wave, shaking the dewdrops off in a small shower that ended the rainbow dance of light. Leighton noted that with full sunrise, the birdsong from a nearby tree rose in volume and changed in tone. From that tree came a rustle of leaves, and in a burst and a scatter, a flock of blue and yellow tits launched themselves in flight. He watched closely as a yellow tit on the edge of the flock glided too wide on its flight path, breaking briefly from the main mass of birds, its claw caught on the web, sending the lines trembling in earnest and scattering the remaining dewdrops in a violent shower. The web held the tit firm. 
It flared its tail feathers wide, an unfurling fan, and flapped its wings feverishly, pulling on the web, stretching it out in a vain attempt to break it, to break free. Its morning chirping turned into a high-pitched, discordant piping. The web recoiled at the bird's attempts to escape, pulling it in with a bounce, catching it whole, encompassing it in sticky strands that prevented it from struggling any further. Wrapped at last, the tit still tried to fight back, but could only nudge half a wing and cock its head frantically from side to side, and nothing more. Leighton's keen vision noted the dual black and white stripes that lined the yellow sides of the bird from head to tail, and in the sheen of its eyes, he imagined he saw its terror. Suspended on a thin strand that lengthened from its rear spinnerets, Leighton's prey presented itself. The giant spider slid down from the upper foliage of the tree where it had been waiting. Landing on the main part of the web, it released itself and slunk to the captured tit on its long, thin legs, clicking its jaws with a tick-tick-tick sound that the boy hunter had always found maddening. Now, Leighton thought, before the spider can lay a claw on the tit... The spider was swift, but the hunter swifter. To the spider's compound eyes, it seemed like a part of the tree trunk had detached itself or had stretched a long arm out to reach it. A flick of hand and of wrist, and Leighton sent his dagger flying, a soft, yielding squelch, the splatter of gray ooze, an inhuman shriek of pain. A second blade followed the first. Then Leighton brought his short bow to four and sent two arrows arcing into the air. All weapons found their marks in abdomen and thorax. The giant spider fell from its web and landed back first onto the grass with a sickly thud, trembling legs thrust into the air. A pool of the gray ooze swelled from beneath its body. With an arrow still notched to the string, Leighton prowled over to the spider, still wary. It was nearly a medium-sized one, a young adult about three feet long, not including the legs. Leighton calculated how much venom he could extract from it and counted himself fortunate that his first kill of the day was of fair size. A good start. Approaching, he noted that some of its legs still twitched and spasmed. The spider's head, though barely moving, was not completely still. Giant spiders were difficult kills and instinctively smarter than trained dogs. This one could very well just be drawing him in. His wariness paid off when two of its legs suddenly reached for him and with sharp claws drew a rough and noticeable scratch along the side of his right boot. Leighton hopped back, taking a second to inspect his feet and to exhale in relief that the leather of his boots had not torn. The spider clumsily righted itself, faced him and hissed, but weakly. From its wounds, gruel-like clumps of gray blood fell onto the grass. Leighton pulled back the string of his bow, took aim, and shot again. The arrow buried itself in the hump of the spider's back. This time, when it fell, it made no sound. Though the mist had long since dissolved with the light of day, morning in the forest was as cold as Leighton's nervous sweat. With his eyes, he measured the length of the scratch on his boot. In spite of his thick clothing, Leighton shivered, and the chill in the air was not the reason. Leighton pulled on a thick pair of leather gloves and kneeled beside the spider's corpse. To one unaccustomed, the sight and stench of it would have been enough to repel the hardiest of hunters. But this was neither the first spider he had killed, nor the first animal he had ever cut open. But it was the first spider whose venom sack he needed. He retrieved his daggers from where their handles protruded out of the spider's body. He used one of them to pry open the spider's mandibles, and with the other, sawed, poked, and prodded the mouth and head until a suitable gash had been made. The flesh was fairly soft and easy to slice through, especially around the eyes, but Leighton's cuts were neither neat nor smooth, not that he cared for precision. His only concern was to avoid letting his open skin touch any part of the spider. He couldn't be sure if simple contact with his flesh would be fatal, but it was best not to take any chances. Once the hole was large enough, he reached gingerly inside the head and pulled out the whitish, bulbous membrane that was the venom sack. It was small and delicate, about the size and weight of a large sling stone. He raised it to the light, studying it for a moment. With steady fingers, he dangled it in front of his eyes by the filmy vein that served as a tube through which the poison flowed. Satisfied, he carefully coiled the vein into a tight knot and placed the sack inside a skin-lined box 
that he drew from his pack. He then cleaned his weapons and gloves, wiping the spider's scum on the wet grass before standing up to leave. The tit cheeped, a forlorn sound drawing his attention. Troubled, weighing some heavy decision, Leighton hesitated before climbing up the tree. In careful haste, he sawed through the web and picked the sticky strands off the bird's feathers until it could spread its wings once more. He left it on an unwebbed tree branch, where it spared a few moments in song before flying off to rejoin its flock. small and helpless. For an hour, that was how she lay, on a mat inside the house with Elia. Her cheeks, no longer ruddy, were wan and held a pallor he had seen before, but only on the old and dying. Something inside him shriveled to almost nothing. Your sister still breathes, Ilya said. Her voice was heavy, tired, raspy. She had been chanting for the better part of forty minutes, praying fervently. Leighton had nothing to offer or share to help the healer. If the gods were truly merciful, then maybe they would have saved his parents, and they would still be alive, and he and Liesel would not be orphans. When some years before the rains had fallen and the river had overflowed its beds, Father Gerald had called for the faithful to aid the families living nearby. His mother and father had answered the summons, even if Leighton had implored them not to leave him and Liesel. Our friends need help, Leighton. They would do the same for us if we were in need. Those were their final words to him. The river had risen too much and too swiftly, and though his parents had saved many, they themselves had been carried away. His parents had died despite their faith. So he did not believe in the mercy of invisible gods, whose priests and priestesses claim blind belief from their faithful. All the devotion given them wasn't worth the time. And yet, Elia, his mother's best friend, was the only healer in the village willing to help. Despite his lack of faith, he was grateful that she had come. She was taking a dangerous risk in doing so. Disobeying her superior's orders could result in the loss of her rank and expulsion from the church. Please, Leighton had pleaded in front of the church doors earlier that day. Unused to begging, he had found himself doing so in sheer desperation. No. Father Gerald's voice pierced like one of Leighton's arrows. The gifts of the gods are only for the faithful. Liesel is dying, father. Only you can save her. Why did you turn your back on the gods, Leighton? Father Gerald thundered. You were brought up to be of the faith. Your mother and father were our finest. You have become their shame. At the admonishment, Leighton's response choked in his throat. How could he answer that he blamed not only the gods but Father Gerald for his parents' deaths. Please, Father, if not for me, for Liesel. No. You killed your spirit the day you left the church, Leighton. You killed your sisters when you took her with you. And now you alone are responsible for the death of her body. It hurts me to turn my back on you. But you are no longer of the faith. Father Gerald shut the church doors in his face. Is this the way the gods show mercy? Leighton screamed at the doors. Would my father and mother stay faithful to such a merciless church? From the church's upper window, Ilya had caught his eye. The anguish in her face mirrored his own. She nodded to him, and she had followed him discreetly back to his house. I have cast the best of the gods' spells that I know but it will not cure her. Ilya turned to him and sighed. She is still a child. Her body cannot yet fight the poison enough to resist death. Even with my help, full-grown men would be sick for days, and this spider's bite is serious. There are reasons why children are not taken into the deep woods. She looked at him accusingly. What can be done? Leighton whispered, not meeting her eyes, fearing her answer. Ilya perceived his suffering and softened her voice. I wish that, like Father Gerald, my healing spells were more powerful, my faith 
deeper. I can only slow the poison, not remove it. Leighton drew a cold hand across his forehead and looked down at Liesel. She is only twelve, he whispered. There were just the two of them now. He could not stand the thought of losing her as he had lost his parents. Leave the bird alone, he had told her, but she had been blinded by her pity and her love for the forest's smaller creatures. It won't take long, Liesel had replied. Besides, we both hate spiders. So let's take away one of their meals. As she approached the web, her attention to the struggling sparrow had made her careless. She had failed to notice the lurking danger in the flowering bushes by her feet until it was too late. <coughs> Even more experienced hunters have fallen to the spiders, Leighton thought, not wanting to blame Liesel, and succeeded in doing so by turning the blame on himself. He chastised himself with Elia's words. There are reasons why children are not taken into the deep woods. But he had wanted her to learn early the ways of hunting, and she had been willing and eager to be trained so. He had trusted in his skills to protect them both. Now, the price of his mistake pained him more than any injury or poison. I have postponed her death, Ilya said after a pause. Perhaps I have bought some time. Bought some time for what? Leighton said. He was not attuned to the idleness of prayer, but his spirit picked up at the hint of some meaningful action. My skill with herbs and plants is greater than my spells. She pointed to a dark corner of the room. On the floor lay an upturned giant spider, a young one, black and hairy, almost a foot long. Leighton had skewered it with an arrow the moment he saw it leap from its hiding place, but he had shot too slow to prevent it from attacking his sister. What is killing her can also be used to save her, she said. Yes? Leighton took heart. His eyes shone with expectancy. You must kill enough of these filthy spiders that infest the forest, the healer said. She palmed a rag before grabbing the dead spider by a leg and hoisting it up onto a nearby table. Collect the poison they carry behind their jaws, like so. From among the many implements on the table, she picked two thin, pointed knives. Healer and hunter bent over the spider in silent examination. She showed him how to spread the jawbones wide, how to extract the venom sac from within the head. She raised the small, nearly empty venom sac of the dead spider to the light and taught him how to tie the source vein into a tight knot to prevent the fluid from escaping. With enough venom, I can make a serum that will save her. This Leighton understood. More than chance and spells. How much is needed? Ilya sighed again and rummaged through her pack. From it, she brought forth a skin-lined box. She raised the lid, shook its contents out onto the table, and presented it to him. It was a partitioned box, no larger than a small wineskin. But to Leighton's eyes, it seemed huge and overwhelmingly empty. The venom sacks of these spiders are sturdier than they look. But this box will protect them from bursting by chance. Fill it, she said simply, handing it to him. This much is needed? Yes, she said. I will have to mix a large portion of the spider poison with other ingredients. Boil and dissolve away what makes it so deadly. Some of the ingredients I already have here. Some I will have my children collect from the forest. But these other ingredients are easy to find, and I can prepare them while you are away. Yours is the difficult task. How much time do I have? he asked. Return in three days, she said. A chill filled Leighton's stomach. She did not need to explain what would happen if he failed. Leighton gathered his pack, bow and quiver, from where they lay against the door, and was about to step out when Elia touched his shoulder. How old are you, boy? I am almost seventeen. You are strong and skilled, but young, Ilya said, and Leighton thought he detected pity in the healer's voice. So young and so jaded. You do not believe in the gods. After what happened to your parents, I cannot blame you. 
The gods. They have their reasons, boy. She continued. He allowed himself a distasteful grimace at her words, but bit back any retort. He was grateful to the healer and did not want to offend her. But neither did he want to argue about the motives of the gods. Elia sensed his resistance. In your youth and haste, do not be rash and incautious, she said, changing what she had planned to say, guessing rightly that now was not the correct time. If the spiders kill you, they will be taking more than just your life. Leighton shifted his gaze to his dying sister. I will care for her until you return. He ran off, grim, determined, and afraid. He had five arrows left in his quiver and a glint of hope in his heart because the box was almost full. To be in time to save his sister, Leighton had to begin his trek back in several hours. Lines of frustration crossed his forehead when he remembered accidentally slicing through one of the venom sacks in his haste to cull it. The box would have been that much closer to full if he had taken more care. The potency of the spider's poison struck him fully when drops from the torn sack landed on the ground and the grass it touched withered before his eyes in an instant. Liesel's pale face floated in his memory as he thought of the same poison flowing through her blood. The boy hunter's shoulders sagged. He was tired, more tired than he had felt in a long time. He had chosen not to stop except for a few hours of sleep each night, pushing his body to the hunt as hard as he could. Even the mightiest of hunters fail in their strength without rest, and Leighton now felt the limits of his own. A small worry crept into his mind. He suspected that the giant spiders had begun to grow leery of him. Somehow they knew they were being hunted. Did they communicate with each other in some way? He had wasted more than an hour watching a day-old web. When a squirrel had at last caught itself in it, he had waited for the spider to reveal itself. But none came. Perhaps it had seen him and skittered away. As he freed the squirrel, uncertainty plagued him. He needed a few more kills before he could return. If his suspicions were true, then his task had become that much harder. He needed to be more careful. While scanning the trees for newly woven webs, Leighton's ears picked up a sound he least expected to hear so deep in the woods. A human voice calling for help. Please! Help! On instinct, he followed the cries, taking each step quickly but with prudence. Leighton neared, and the voice grew in volume, changing from one seeking help to one of anger and defiance. Leighton couldn't help noting the rising panic in its tone and its familiarity. Go! The voice shouted. Away! Away! Leighton hid behind the trunk of a large tree and peered around it into a forest clearing. Partially entangled in an expansive web, Father Gerald, in soiled traveling garments, struggled. He had fallen to his knees, but in his free hand he still brandished a stout quarterstaff. He swung it with desperation against an approaching shadow, the weaver of the web, the largest spider the hunter had yet encountered. Not including its long, angled legs, it was at least seven feet long from tip to tip, and was markedly wider than a heavy bear. The tick, tick, tick that clicked from its jaws was louder and more menacing than the sound the smaller ones made. The massive spider retreated a few feet each time the old man swung his staff. But how long could he keep it at bay? (laughs) To Leighton, the spider's intentions were clear. It was waiting its foe out, waiting for fatigue, thirst, and hunger to overcome its captive rather than risk injury to itself. Perhaps Father Gerald could have freed himself if he were left alone. Perhaps not. But the constant presence of the spider saw to it that escape was impossible. Leighton's emotions swirled. He could go on his way and leave Father Gerald to his fate. In his mind, no one deserved death more. But time was running short, and he still lacked a sufficient quantity of venom. This spider would have more than enough, surely. Dread overcame his weariness. He did not know if he could take on such a behemoth. 
he wrestled with the choice of leaving and hunting for easier prey. He peered around the tree again. Father Gerald looked up, and their eyes met. He saw in the old man's expression the same horror that he had read on Liesel's face just before the spider bit into her leg and injected her with the fatal poison. Just a few days ago, he remembered thinking that if the spiders killed him, they would be taking more than his own life. In good conscience, he could not leave the old man. He thought instead of how much venom he could collect from this kill, and that by defeating this monster, he would be saving two lives and not one. Or the spider could overcome him and take three, Father Gerald's, his own, and his sister's. Leighton grimaced, but he thought of his parents and whispered soft words to himself. I am their son. His choice made, Leighton notched an arrow to his bowstring, aimed, loosed. His arrow found its mark at the base of the spider's neck. Its squeal hurt his ears. He cocked and shot a second arrow. Missing such a large target was impossible, but he had to hit the vital parts, or he would inflict nothing more than superficial wounds. The giant spider, dripping with gray blood, twisted, searched, tracked the flight of arrows, and found him. With a ferocity and speed that Leighton did not expect from a creature so huge, it rushed at him on legs that only seemed spindly when seen against its gigantic body, but in reality were as thick as spears. He was forced to drop the third arrow he had already set to the bowstring so he could fling himself to the ground and away. The spider slammed its body against the tree mere moments after his escape. Leighton rolled on the ground and found his footing in one smooth motion. He ran for the next tree, intending to shoot from behind it and use it as a shield as he did the first. But the spider was fast, faster than a hawk, and it was all he could do to put the tree between him and the monster before it was already upon him like a nightmare. He had to rush away once more before it could reach out to him with a clawed leg. He shuffled swiftly into the clearing, turned, dropped to one knee, and let fly again, his marksmanship rewarding him with another squeal when the arrow buried itself somewhere near the head. He prayed he had somehow found its eyes. The spider had caught itself on some low-hanging branches, and Leighton used the moments it spent disengaging itself to get back to his feet and to scramble across the grass. Passing near the web, he saw his own fear reflected back at him in Father Gerald's eyes. From the folds of his clothes, the old man had produced a small knife and was attempting desperately to cut himself free. Leighton did not dare turn his head for fear of discovering just how close on his heels the giant spider was. He kept his eyes on the other side of the clearing, thinking only of the cover the undergrowth would give him, moving as quickly as he could to safety behind the nearest tree. Barely making it around in time, the impact of the spider's body slamming into the tree trunk rattled his teeth and sent a cascade of leaves and branches falling around him. Crouching down, moving forward, and trying to protect his bow from damage, he drew a long knife from its sheath at his belt and hacked away at the spider's appendages that encircled the tree and sought to envelop him. Just as he was about to take a step out of the spider's reach, he cried out. Something sharp had torn his shoulder open. He knew from the pain that the wound was serious. He fell to the forest floor and scrambled away till the foliage grew too dense for him to draw further back. If not for the narrow space, it would have surely been upon him. As it was, the spider furiously tried to scrabble between the closely growing trees, but could not squeeze through. Leighton was safe for the moment. He tried to inspect his injury, but the slightest touch drew pain. The spider, still enraged, chittered at him. Leighton noticed with satisfaction that one of his arrows, snapped halfway through the shaft with the fletched end dangling, had found the spider's right cluster of eyes. If he was to die, he would take satisfaction in the grievous harm he had caused it. Leighton felt, with sudden panic, a numbness like expanding ice begin to grow from his bleeding shoulder. He tried to fight it, but his arm had already stiffened, the veins in it bulging, throbbing, becoming an ugly, angry purple. The ground shuddered, then rose. The giant spider was forcing its way through the tree trunks. Its advancing bulk pushed them further apart, bending and creaking in protest, widening the gap, allowing it to inch forward and nearer. What Leighton felt beneath him was the intricate tangle of the buried tree roots rising as they were slowly lifted free from the earth. The spider's mandibles clacked together, tick, 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 as it closed the distance between them. Leighton knew all was lost. He could think only of Liesel as he fought the spider's poison and mustered what strength remained in him to sit up and notch his final arrow to his bow. 
through clenched teeth and burning curses, he drew his bowstring back. Ignoring the pain in his shoulder and the iciness now touching his neck, his chest, his heart, and let loose his last shot. As his arrow struck home, blasts of light and fire burst forth from behind the spider in a series of flashes and roaring explosions. The spider's shrill screams pierced the forest again. It squirmed backward, but found that it could do so but slowly. The tree trunks had wedged it firmly, stifling its retreat. Each flash from the clearing caused it to rear up and scream again. The spider's struggle to free itself slowed and weakened till it gave one mighty shiver before slumping to the ground. The flames roaring behind it shrank to a soft sizzle. The smell of its burnt flesh filled the air. So close to the dead spider, Leighton knew he should be feeling the heat of the fire prickling his skin. But he could not. He felt cold all over. Someone touched him. Father Gerald had come hustling from around the spider's body, concern etched on his face. The tip of his quarterstaff glowed orange, a burning ember that trailed wisps of smoke. He supported Leighton, setting him gently to the ground. His lips were moving, but the hunter did not hear his words. With great effort, Leighton reached for his arm. Through the cold that threatened to take him at any moment, he used his waning strength to tell Father Gerald of the venom sacks he had collected, of the serum, to again plead with him that if he would not heal his sister, to at least bring the sacks to Ilya. To To his ears, his own voice sounded as if it came from a great distance. But the old man wasn't listening. He had dropped his quarterstaff, closed his eyes, and lifted his hands to the treetops, mumbling to himself. Stop the sacks! Leighton hissed, but after uttering these words, he could no longer speak. His throat went numb, and soon after his vision failed, and he fell into a swoon. Well, you'll be all right. Leighton opened his eyes, and the green canopy of trees rose above him. He turned his head. Father Gerald was kneeling at his side, his hands on his lap, his concern replaced with relief, his smile wide and kindly. It was a smile Leighton had not seen for years, not since he was a child who still trusted Father Gerald, and not since his parents had died. Leighton sat up and became aware that Though his tunic was torn at the shoulder, he felt no pain. His wound was healed, only a thin, faint line, white against his skin, remained. The cold had vanished. Why? Leighton said. You refused, Liesel. Why did you heal me? Father Gerald looked down at his palms and did not speak for some moments. I know you blame me and the gods for your parents' deaths, Leighton, he said with difficulty. Believe me. I blamed myself, but my pride could not accept your leaving the faith and your taking Liesel with you. I became angry at your brashness, failing to see my own, failing to see my cruelty. That there is an excuse for such in the young, but not in the old and supposedly wiser. I heard your words. Would your father and mother have stayed faithful to such a church? The answer is no. They were better people than I. I prayed after you left, saw in the depths of my prayers my proud errors, and so came after you to take back with remorse my evil words. When Ilya opened the door and saw me standing there, she nearly fainted. It took me some time to assure her that I had come not to punish her but to heal Liesel. Even Ilya has shamed me by showing more compassion. When I learned where you had gone, my guilt returned tenfold, and I set out immediately to find you. Liesel, she is well? She is. Leighton held his head in his hands and murmured his quiet thanks. In this, my later years, I've learned that neither faith nor forgiveness should be forced. One is a choice, and the other of true worth only if freely given. 
I ask you both to forgive me, the old man said. And, if you will have it so, to return to the faith. This is not the failing of the gods, but mine. Father Gerald picked up his quarterstaff, now a plain stick of wood again, and nothing more, and used it to hoist himself to his feet. He wrinkled his nose at the dead spider. Thank you for coming to my aid, the old man said, and held his hand out. Leighton took it, and found himself hauled to his feet by the old man's surprising strength. For a moment there, I believed you would leave me. Leighton said nothing, and Father Gerald read the possibility in his silence. I may have deserved that, Father Gerald said. So my gratefulness to you is all the more humble. You chose more wisely and more bravely when you tried to save me than I did in refusing to cure Liesel. When she woke, your sister asked for you straight away. She awaits your return. Lead the way home, Hunter. Many burdens inside Leighton lifted, some of which he did not know that he had carried or were so heavy. For the first time in days, he smiled. Author's Note I wrote Spider Hunt on a dare from another writer friend. I hadn't written a high fantasy, sword and sorcery, heroic action adventure story in a long time, while my friend, for the most part, pretty much writes nothing but. He challenged me to try, but I wasn't sure I could come up with something interesting. Yet in the end, I said to myself, why not? Let's give it a shot. I was in my early and mid-teens when I first read a lot of the high fantasy, the kind with the tropes that this kind of story called for. So my guiding thought in writing Spider Hunt was to come up with a tale that the 15-year-old boy in me would enjoy. With that kind of thinking, I knew I needed a desperate fight to the death with a formidable and dangerous monster to please that kind of reader. And I had the final fight scene in my mind right from the start. But how to plausibly get there? That's where the adult in me came in, the one that understood not just instinctively, but wholeheartedly the love one could have for a family member, the difficulties of trying to live within any kind of faith, and the effects pride, compassion, remorse, and vengeance have on people, and how these emotions can move people one way or the other. One of the rules I've heard other writers offer is to make your character suffer, and with what I knew of those issues I just mentioned, I think I made my protagonist suffer a lot before coming up with a positive resolution. It helped a lot that I could come up with the kind of happy ending that the story had because all the characters in the story were, at their cores, inherently good people. In the end, my friend's challenge wasn't as hard as I thought it would be, and I was pleasantly surprised to find that in writing this story, the boy in my heart is still very much reachable and alive. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the story. Did you have a good hunt? Hunt. Stop it. <laughs> this story was an interesting story because we had sort of a hard time reading it. Yeah, poor Brian. Brian Lincoln. He's one of, I guess he's our longest standing producer on the show, aside from you and I. <laughs> so he's back again for another helping have a heap and helping of our hospitality. There you go. He's back again going, thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> As we continue to haze him. He's a good guy. He's got that full cast podcast uh, that he has mentioned us a lot of times on. Yeah. It's a cool podcast, too. If you're into doing audio fiction, if you would like to learn how to produce, you can learn a lot from listening to that. Another thing that he doesn't really do much anymore, but he could do, if you have a question of how to do something, you can send that to him and he'll answer it on the podcast. Yeah, that's right. Whereas we try to stay far away from our viewer mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so check out his podcast. I always feel bad when we spend a lot of time with the recording and somebody's going to have to sift through it and edit things out. This was one of those... It's not that the story is difficult to read. Uh, it's not out of the storm or anything like that. But it 
it just got us giggling like a couple of 12 year old girls. And <laughs> yeah, for some reason, every sentence that we read seemed to have a hidden bit of innuendo <laughs> just worked into it. Obviously, there was the reference to the bird that gets caught in the spider web. We, we had a hard time getting over that bird's name. Because we are 12 also. <laughs> yes, we are. Sadly, we're really immature for our age. Yeah, we just kept going. And it, it's funny because right after we sent the uh, story out to Brian to edit, he went straight to work. He cut it down, did a uh, rough edit of the story and removed all the outtakes from the story and just kept what was uh, necessary. And right after he uh, he did that, he uh, sent out a tweet, which I happened to get, and it said, started another Doonstief story today. Rough cut of the narration, 36 minutes. Rough cut of the blooper reel, 32 minutes. Still laughing. <laughs> Four minutes shy <laughs> on the blooper reel of outstripping the length of the entire story. Yeah, I, I do feel bad that Brian had to wade through all of that. Hopefully, and we haven't heard the blooper reel yet upon this recording. Hopefully it's funny. I don't know. Can we really do a 32-minute blooper reel? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, was that the one where it was really, really, really late at night and we wanted to quit? And we're like, but Brian is just right there waiting like the Richard Marx song. If we stay up just a little while longer and record this, then he'll have that and he'll be able to work on it. And we, you know, because we don't want him to not have something to work on. And yeah. so it was like 345 <laughs> or something like that. Am, is, am I remembering that it right? It may have been. Ever since people started volunteering to produce stuff for us, we've kind of been that way every time. We're like, oh, this guy said he would, he would edit. We can't just let him not edit we haven't accepted any <laughs> stories what should we do he's like well let's just record the first submission on the list let's just make up a story as we go along we've done that a few times i think so it could very well have been this story that we did that with as well but yeah i, I do remember the one you're talking about where yeah i think my wife she had to work really early that morning and she had gotten up and gotten dressed and gotten in the car and left for work and we, we were still, still recording. recording on the story that's definitely uh, uh, something that I think is important is if we got somebody who's willing to edit, I hate to have them just sit there picking their nose waiting for us to finally send something their way. We've never been this far ahead before. <laughs> it is just weird. We look at the list and shoot, well, what do we do now? It won't air for three months, but what do we record tonight? <laughs> pretty great. It's pretty cool. You know, an interesting thing about this story in his author's note – he said that he wrote this story on a dare. Now, the dare that he mentions is that his friend dared him to write a story that was a fantasy story. But I think I remember as we were reading this story, we kept cracking up. I mean, the bird was a tit. You are. And, and we couldn't not laugh at this for some reason. Then here and there in other places, other words that could be construed as naughty bits were used i think there was a point where we wondered to each other you know i wonder if somebody dared this guy to write a story that uses all these dirty words in legitimate ways do you think that could have been possible strangely enough he was dared to write this story uh, he didn't mention that he was dared to use naughty bits in the text, but who knows? <laughs> I guess that not necessarily something you'd mention in the author's note. Well, he also wrote it for the 15-year-old in him. There you go. And definitely the 15-year-old <laughs> in us was interpreting things in wildly inappropriate manner. And said, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 he said shaft. Oh. <laughs> cool. Are you threatening me? I am Cornholio. I need some TP for my bunghole. I used to actually be able to do those voices. Yeah. <laughs> but it's been so long. Yeah, Beavis and Butthead are one of those that just went away. They're not revered like other cartoon. Oh, sir, you are so wrong. I think they've got like the, the new shiny CG reboot of the Beavis and Butthead franchise coming to a theater near oh, you. Because everything that Hollywood comes up with is something from 
a very short while ago that they feel like they need to spit polish up and get ready out. Uh, you were telling me about that the other day. This is taking us wildly off the subject, but what else is new? That they're rebooting or redoing a new version of the Thundercats cartoon on Cartoon Network. Good Lord, I hate Thundercats. <laughs> yeah, when I saw that, now I know that you didn't hate Thundercats, either that or if you loved it in an ironic way, like the like I love the theme song to Mr. Belvedere, <laughs> which is the worst theme song ever, but I'm constantly like, oh, sing the theme song to Mr. Belvedere. Daddy? Did and, Mrs. Uh, Outfield ever have any children that lived? But yeah, you uh, you would talk about Snarf all the time. <laughs> did not talk about Snarf. You did. I didn't. Did, did, did. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Thundercats no, came out when I was a young man. I wasn't even a young man. I was just a child. And yeah, it was just one of those shows that I thought was cool for about a year. I, I, I think it went on for longer than a year. And I think I've seen reruns of the show on Cartoon Network or Boomerang or whatever the channel is that shows old TV shows. And they're from an era of this show that I never knew existed. There's a bunch of new characters that I'd never heard of that are on the show and stuff like that. So I guess I didn't like it for all that long. But yeah, I thought it was cool for a while and I, you know, tried to come up with new Thundercats that could be part of the show. And I thought of this cat or that cat or whatever that wasn't represented in the show at the time. But yeah, you know, then six months later I moved on to something else. But I never forgot Snarf. Um. <laughs> now, see, I a heck of a lot less mature than you are. <laughs> and yet, I was too old for Thundercats. I recognized it as a really crappy He-Man ripoff even when it aired. Mm -hmm. But I guess just where I happened to be at the time, was it also one of those shows that was invented to sell toys like Transformers, G.I. Joe? I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen a toy of a Thundercat. So I'm guessing that it wasn't, but maybe they just did a crappy job at selling toys. But the fact that it's beloved enough that they're going to make a new version of it. Oh, I think, yeah, the new version is already airing. But Yeah, it would make me think that it wasn't one of those shows made just to sell toys or else you'd know about the toys. You'd have heard of them. You'd have seen them. Oh, good point. You probably would have had one of them. I mean, I had toys of the Sectars. <laughs> You know, that's a way more obscure thing than the Thundercats ever were. Yeah, It's kind of like Mr. Belvedere, you know. I remember when I got online the first time and you had to come up with some kind of online name. And yeah, Snarf is just one of those supremely goofy names that I thought it would be funny to use that as my username on various message boards and etc. like that. And when I met some of the people that I met on the message boards, I met them in real life for the first time. You know, you come up to someone and you're like, hey, and they're like, hey, I don't know who the hell you are because you've only met them on the little message board. So you're like, yeah. I'm Family Matters Urkel Jism 17. Right. So you introduce yourself by your stupid handle. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Snarf. And they're like, oh, yeah. I used to love Thundercats, and I have to be like, eh, I don't really love the Thundercats. I just think Snarf is a funny name. And eventually, I went through and changed my name, so it wasn't Snarf anymore, and just made it my real name, so I could just say, yeah, I'm, I'm Big Anklevich. Nice to meet you. And they go, oh, Big Anklevich. Okay. Good to meet you. Yeah, I was super into Anklevichs when I was a kid. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about that goofy awkwardness that, yeah, that, yeah that used to drive me crazy, so I just gave it up. The reason I mentioned Thundercats at all um, is just you're talking about how lame movies are and how they just grab something that was cool 10 years ago and remake it into something new. When I heard about this remake of Thundercats, I wondered, is this some kind of a herald of what is to come for TV? Right now, TV is just so much better than movies are because movies are just lame remakes and sequels of things that you've already seen before whereas tv has got interesting new ideas and they and they can develop them so much more because you know series episodic shows just keep going and going but if they're going to start remaking old shows i guess that's something that they've kind of always done though so that's probably nothing right they made a new fantasy island. <laughs> yeah, we've got a new Hawaii Five-0 right now. Oh, yeah, new there you v go. Right now. Uh, so I guess it's not necessarily a herald of things to come, but maybe, who knows, if TV falls into the same trap that Hollywood films have fallen into, then it will be a sad day for us all. When there'll be nothing left in entertainment. There'll be reality shows and remakes. 
Ooh. That, that's a good title for a book, Reality Shows and Remakes. Oh. The, the End is Nigh <laughs> by Clay Duggar. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, well, I, I've got two questions. One, how did the theme song to Mr. Belvedere go? <laughs> Freaks on the channel, never wrote as before. Who cares? Okay, that's oh, enough of that. Worst theme song of all time. <laughs> and second, you mentioned the sectars. They were action figures that rode on bugs, right? Yeah, they were. Was like, there a spider? Yeah, there was. Uh, there was a spider and a dragonfly, I think. And you, you, it was a big hairy glove, and you would put your hand into it, and your hand would be the legs of the spider, which was pretty cool. Um, and spiders are cool. That's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we picked today's stories, because spiders are awesome. And giant spiders, holy crap. I'm a big fan of giant spiders. God, can you imagine a giant spider? I don't know. I've I've seen people talking about spiders and the insane crap that spiders can do to catch their prey and just how unbelievably dangerous these things are. And I've, I've seen it more than once where people be talking about spiders and then they finish off. Boy, isn't it a good thing that they're an inch in size <laughs> instead of big enough that we could be their prey. What's the biggest spider you've ever seen? Because you've been to the rainforest, right? I saw a tarantula in the wild once. That was interesting. It was eating a German shepherd, ladies <laughs> yes, and gentlemen. it was. No, I, you know, it's the size of a tarantula, which is... Is there larger spiders than tarantulas? I don't know that I've ever seen a larger spider or heard of a larger no, spider I, than well, a tarantula. I think there's like a bird. We should ask Liz, the animal, animal guru. guru. Yeah, she'd the, probably there's, know. There's a, a bird spider. I think it's a, just a cousin to a tarantula. It looks exactly like a tarantula, but it, it lives in trees and it catches birds. It eats birds. It's that big. Wow. It bald eagles, hawks, <laughs> vultures, <Condors>. ostriches. Ostriches. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest one I've seen. It was pretty funny because I was walking along down the street with this friend of mine and we saw this tarantula in the road and we're like, holy crap, it's a tarantula in the road. You know, we were freaking out that there's this tarantula. I guess we should have expected it because, you know, we are in the rainforest, but uh we see this thing and we're, and we're like, oh my gosh. And it was just sitting there, you know, it wasn't moving, wasn't doing anything. And we're kind of like circling around it and looking at it. And I picked up a stick and I kind of like reached down real slow with a stick and I nudged the spider. And did it do that thing with its legs? It threw him up? <laughs> it didn't attack the stick at all. But what it did do is it jumped up onto its leg because it had kind of been like all squatted and balled up or whatever. We were wondering if it was even alive. And that's one of the reasons why I poked it. But yeah, it jumped up and it took off. At full speed, right at my friend. <laughs> and he told me later that the, the funny thing about it was the first thing that he thought of doing wasn't so much avoiding the spider, but was to punch me for getting this stupid spider to chase him the way it did. How fast does a tarantula move? <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you know how fast bugs move. I mean, obviously, he could outrun the spider. And so he wasn't afraid for his life. But, you know, who isn't freaked out by spiders? Seriously, is there such a person out there that isn't scared at least a little bit by a spider? When you see a giant spider like a tarantula? I mean, I was going to say, I'm not freaked out by spiders, but yeah, okay, I am a little bit. Now, see, I, I must have, well, you grew up in the city. I grew up in a farm, mm -hmm. and we had tarantulas all, not all over, but we had tarantulas locally. And I remember being just a really, really little kid, and we were driving uh, up the canyon, and my dad stopped the truck. And I assumed that it was for a snake because sometimes there would be rattlesnakes or they would be you know, water snakes or garter snakes or whatever. And he would stop so that I could see them. But, oh, my mom was just like, drive, drive, drive. <laughs> and I said, like, what is it? What is it? And he's like, come up here and look. And I looked and there was a tarantula crossing the road and on its back – were many, many baby tarantulas. Oh, gosh. And that stuck with me. That was the first time I had ever seen that kind of thing. But uh, when I was in high school and I finally got a driver's license and I was able to drive around the canyon myself, I stopped one time and caught a tarantula and brought it in for my biology teacher. And he thanked me and said, okay, you know, I, I'm going to take this out and, and don't say anything. 
and so you know he welcomed everybody to class and he turned his back to the class and I knew what he was doing but nobody else in the class knew what was going to happen mm -hmm. and what he did was he took the tarantula and he put it on his necktie <laughs> and just so that it was it was hanging on there and so then he turned around and he said so uh, class I you know welcome you uh, we're going to have a pop quiz but I'll give you a few minutes to study and there started to be people going <gasps> And a, a little rumble and a gasp and all this stuff of people of recognition of seeing this. But he nonchalantly was talking about it. He's like, okay, well, today we're going to be talking about the reproductive system of, of the whales or something like that. And I swear it was three or four minutes into the class. And one of those girls, the cheerleader type, the ones that would be texting through class today <laughs> went, ah! sorry, I, I should have warned you. <clears throat> but she screamed. And everybody, I mean, if everybody freaked out and spun around to see, you know, what had happened to her, <laughs> but she was pointing and she had just now discovered there was a tarantula <laughs> on his chest. And sorry, I, I woke up your wife. She has to be at work in like three minutes. And it's uh, all right. The, the thing was, he had no fear of them at all. They were just animals or harmless to him or whatever, but I wouldn't be able to hold a tarantula. I don't yeah. I was able to catch it in a bottle or a cup or a pair of jockey shorts or whatever I caught it in, but I wasn't brave enough to let it crawl on me. And then after I saw Mr. Nielsen do it, I was like, oh geez, you know, he's obviously not afraid and it didn't bite him. Then he passed away mysteriously during the <laughs> night. So, uh, you know, I never actually saw this movie when I was, I saw parts of it again and again. I don't know if I could have sat through it to tell you the truth, but a huge movie was Arachnophobia. I'm mm -hmm. sure you watched that because oh, you, you were Mr. You were Mr. Horror Movie fan. Did that movie scare you? It didn't. No. It, no? Not, not really. Like I said, I didn't see the whole thing, but I remember the part where there's the football teams out practicing and the guy's got his helmet sitting on the ground or whatever and a spider runs and gets into it and then he goes and he picks it up and he puts it on and he's running down the field or whatever and then I guess the spider bites him and I think he just dies immediately or something like that. Just the idea of Oh, a spider inside your football helmet as you pull, <laughs> oh, especially a big creepy one like those spiders were in that film, man. Yeah, that's, that's that just kind of freaks me out. I'm surprised they haven't remade that. Already. Yeah, I'm it's, sure they will. It was, I, they're, I would they're, say it was 90? Yeah, it was right around there. It was, it was, I'm surprised, I'm sure they will. I mean, they're, they're doing Nightmare on Elm Street right now. So, you know, a few years down the line, they'll make uh, arachnophobia again. But uh, yeah, you know, I remember in football practice the kind of, the kind of crap that we used to do to each other, like pick a long weed, and then while somebody's sitting there paying attention to whatever the coach or whoever's saying, you come up behind them and you stick that in their ear hole and you twist the weed, and it feels like there's a bee or something like that that's just gone in your helmet. You're remember, a monster, you know that. I remember doing that to some guy one time, and he just like. Whoa pulled his helmet off and he's hitting at his ear and looking in his helmet like there's a bee there's a bee in my helmet <laughs> and we're just cracking up but oh can you imagine if that had been a giant spider instead of just someone twisting a weed oh my gosh that just kind of freaks <laughs> uh, me out we've touched on something that actually disturbs you that upsets you <laughs> You know, the 1990 arachnophobia will always be scarier than whatever one they do well, now. Sure, because they'll use actual now they'll spiders. Use CG spiders. <laughs> and no matter how good they are, you'll know they're not really there. Right. Uh, I think there was a puppet spider in arachnophobia, but for the most part, they were real. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The only spider that freaks me out that really bothers me is the black widow spider. And, and again, I grew up in a place where they would just infest the house. I don't know why. That we'd find them all the time behind the television or something like that. Oh, and I don't know how they get in except for, you know, the end of Charlotte's Web. They tiny little teeny ones fly on the wind, somehow come into the house. But black widows do disturb and frighten me. Because they're poisonous. They can kill you. Anything that's got that kind of a power is, is freaky, especially when you can just find it behind your TV or wherever. You know, we've had a fair number of black widow spiders at this house because, you know, we live out in the middle of nowhere now. Especially when we first moved out here, you know, our house was the first house in the street. You know, there was nobody on our side of the road except for our house. So before that... That's so weird. There's loads of houses. Yeah, now. there are. Yeah, it really filled in now. But yeah, before that, this was just a field. And that was 
the kind of place where spiders lived and rodents and all sorts of crap we used to have trouble with. Now that the neighborhood is filled in and we're nowhere near the edge of, you know, the wilderness, it's not such a problem as it used to be. But <laughs> we used to have black widows like crazy. And we still get them sometimes. But uh, my wife sprayed around the house. and, and We still get them too. I, uh, where I live now, uh-huh. not nearly like the the old house. The old house, they would be inside the house. Now it's always outside. Yeah, the we always wells. get them in the window wells and that kind of stuff. And one time I went down into our basement and do you know what a hobo spider is? You've probably seen those too because they're pretty. A brown recluse? No, Are you not a brown recluse. you convince me that those exist here? They don't. No, not a brown recluse. It's different. A hobo spider is the... You're a hobo spider. Stop saying hobo. It's the dangerous man. spider around here. Apparently, it's the worst one that there is. There's only two, so it's it's brown recluse you're talking about. It's a hobo spider. is different. But anyways, yeah, I went down into the basement and hanging a big web right on the window. This spider, I swear, was almost the size of my hand. Saw that thing and went, holy crap. We and don't have spiders that big where we live, dude. I, I'm gonna look big as it. your hand. It's it may I may not through my whole life. That might be uh, exaggerating, but. Now you're going to talk about those things in the Middle East. The No, I don't know anything about spiders in the Middle East. I've never those been goats, there. Those camel spiders. But here's a hobo spider. You are. Everybody else can follow along at home and look it up on Wikipedia as well. There's pictures of it. Let's see. Why we, Why do you lie to the audience? Sad. <sighs> that spider scared the crap out. It was it was a large spider, and it was just hanging there. It had built a web right on our window screen in our window well in in the basement. And neighborhood children were yeah, caught like in it. Little kids going, "Help me, help me!" <laughs> I, I went and got the broom and went outside and squashed that thing as quick as I could. And I haven't seen another spider like that since. We have seen other black widows. Little Black widows are little, but I think the blackness of them is part of what makes them really scary. The shininess. And, and they're the not shininess. little, though. I mean, they well, they can be big. Relatively, though. They're not the kind of spider that's going to, you're going to look at it and go, holy crap, that's as big as my hand. Or aren't like, spiders oh, as big as your Big hand. as my ear or something, you know. Okay, which would you have I on think, your scrotum? I think... Uh, I think the other thing that's really creepy about Black Widows is that, like, hourglass-looking red thing that they have on them. Ooh, something about that has pretty creepy markings. It's like a death's head moth or something <laughs> where it's got, like, a mark on it that looks like a skull. Just something scary about that shape that they have on them in red. It's black with a red marking on it. Ooh, that's just nature's warning or something. I'm yeah. not really sure what purpose that serves liz will be able to tell us yeah. in the comments yeah in the comments liz will explain hobo spiders and their uh the and the fact that they don't, don't exist, exist. <laughs> <laughs> and black widows and why they're marked red and black and all sorts of great things yeah i i'm afraid of black widows and I, I, have you ever read richard matheson's incredible shrinking man no i have not it's a fantastic novella i guess you'd call it I'm a big fan of Matheson. Would be neat if we could have one of his stories on the show. We'd get to uh, work. <laughs> I can't even send out my own work, let alone solicit others. But they made a movie of it several years ago, and it's weird that they haven't remade that because, oh, it's ripe for the picking, folks. And I know they wanted to make a remake of it for a long time, but you know, Will Smith gets involved and it all goes to hell. Well, now um, they can make it with all CG. Wouldn't that be awesome? No, sir. They wouldn't have to build any of those sets and make giant Q-tips and that kind oh, of stuff. that's a good point. But in, in the old movie, they used – I guess it was a tarantula and it wasn't scary to me at all even though it was a tarantula that is the size of this room compared to the guy. But on the book, on the, the paperback 90s book cover, they've got him with a needle – in both hands, he can barely hold up the needle, and there's a black widow spider the size of a VW van coming toward him. And it's so upsetting to me. Oh, I just love that cover. And it's like, oh, please, whoever remakes this movie, please do it with a black widow spider. That's so, so scary. Just the way that the black widow is shaped. There's a lot of these, I don't know if they're orb weavers or whatever they'd call them, Liz. 
that are shaped in that certain way. And there's something about that shape, probably because I was taught from a very young age, hey, those are bad. Those are the ones that you yeah, want to stay, stay away, away from. from. those ones. The, you know, the, the big hairy legs don't bother me of the tarantula, but the right. long, spindly, creepy, yeah. those legs bother me. And uh, when The Hobbit comes out, that has giant spiders in it, right? Oh, yeah, I think so. And it has many. It'll be interesting to see how they do that. Obviously, we had Shelob in Return of the King, and you had giant spiders in the second Harry Potter. There was eight-legged freaks. Don't forget about that triumph of modern film. I saw that at Man's Chinese, and I was the only one that didn't like it. And everybody in my group was just like, oh, it was great. Except for one friend that said it was offensive to gay people. But it, <laughs> the movie didn't work for me. Yeah, you know, I have I have a, f uh, a friend at work that's really into monster movies and, and the like, and he likes Eight-Legged Freaks a lot. I think he's able to separate the fact that the movie's terrible, just be able to just go with the campy, cheesy funness of that, you know, just embracing being a terrible movie, I guess. I don't know exactly what it is that makes him think, yeah, yeah, I like that one. I want to buy it on DVD. I want the director's cut with the commentary in five languages. You know, it's funny, uh, the Harry Potter part two, I went and saw that with my wife in the theater when it came out. At that time, our kids were little. What was it? When was 2002. that? 2002. 2002. So that was a while ago. But yeah, we went out, you know, on a, on a date for this movie and we're sitting there watching the movie and it gets to the spider part. And we realized I could never watch arachnophobia with my wife because I, th I think she would have a stroke or a heart attack or some some serious health ailment if we were to do that. Because, yeah, we were watching that spider part and she's getting more and more tense and the bruises that are going to be showing up on my arm as she squeezes tighter and tighter. And then all the spiders come out and they start chasing them. And she's sitting there and watching that. And she's like, ah. she's like, what is this movie rated? <laughs> when she made that comment, it just cracked me up. I was just like, you know, whatever it's rated, it's okay for us to watch. We're adults. There's no such thing as a movie rating that we can't go see now, you know. And she's like, yeah, but but kids are going to watch this. Oh, my gosh, this is the scariest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I thought it was pretty darn humorous, uh, just how freaked out she was by that whole giant spider bit. Well, I guess you'll have to see The Hobbit with me then. <laughs> Probably, because uh, she, she wouldn't be able to handle that. I think in The Hobbit, don't they get all wrapped up in the web and captured for a while? I don't remember. It's been a long time since I, I listened. I think the spiders talk in The Hobbit, or at I least think, the I lead so, one does. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Bifa. Bifa. <laughs> Oin. Gloin. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how they handle that, if they can make it as absolutely creepy as uh, Harry Potter did. I would imagine, and boy, this is, again, once you get to be this old, I would imagine that the spiders in Harry Potter Chamber of Secrets look fake by now. That's probably or true. Or did they look fake then? At a certain point, you know, that uncanny valley, they kind of made it to the point where that stuff's not important. I, I You know, I, I went and saw Tron with uh, my family just the other day and there was the whole cg jeff bridges mm -hmm. which looks great until he has to make facial expressions and speak and and that kind of stuff and then you can see no that's not quite right that's jar jar dancing around there you know he just doesn't quite make it anymore you know you can see oh yeah not quite and that's a 2010 movie. Yeah, right? that's this year. And for some reason, it's always people that are the hardest thing. And may, I guess it's because that's what, you know, we people see the most and find the most important is other people. And so you can you can see when it's wrong easiest when it's people that they're trying to do. And they can make an explosion or a gigantic ocean liner or some crazy alien with six arms and flappy ears or whatever, and, and you'll believe it. But then when they get trying to do a person, then you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, that's not right. Yeah, you watch those Quidditch scenes or any time Harry is on a broom in Sorcerer's Stone. Philosopher's Stone. And, oh, holy cow, it is, it's, a, it's a cartoon. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I think some of that, too, I, and I remember people complaining about the part where the troll comes into the castle and... Uh, 
grabs Harry or Hermione or Ron or whoever it was that he grabs and is like he's flinging them around and they're being tossed about like a rag doll and you're watching that going sure it's CG so you can do whatever you want but shouldn't you make it realistic enough that we can believe that this could happen because oh that's how I felt about the third one when the, the tree grabbed him yeah and, and threw him around like they were earthworms and every single bone in your vertebra would be destroyed if, if that actually could happen to somebody yeah those those kind of things where you're just like oh, uh, I, I can't believe it anymore you guys have gone way too far you know, and I know our bodies can handle some stress and stuff, but at a certain point, yeah, you know, that's just too much. Um, and I think that's kind of the problem with animating people as well as there's the temptation, I guess, to do something like that. I mean, why animate them if they're going to do stuff that people could do for real? That's a question I have. <laughs> why animate anything that couldn't be done with wires or can be done with real people or a stuntman right. or a dummy? There's this shot at the end of Salt where they replace Angelina Jolie with CG for no reason. I, I mean, I guess I, what I heard was it was a you know last minute reshoot. Let's see if we can get a sequel set up uh, here, kind of thing. But it took me out of the movie. It was literally the last minute of the film, and suddenly she's CG, and I was like, oh my gosh, why? You could make an Angelina Jolie mannequin and shoot it. For nothing in a very much more realistic way. I, I, don't, I don't. Anyway, I'm sorry. We've had done an episode on this before, <laughs> but maybe enough time has passed that we need to do it again. There was no Tron. There was no salt. I don't think we talked about Harry Potter when we did the special effects conversation. We were talking about spiders uh -huh. involved in special effects. And... I, I'm sure you've never seen Kingdom of the Spiders. I haven't. And it was like I a haven't. 19. We did an episode called Kingdom of Spiders. We did yeah. on our very own show. Uh, whoever wrote that must have ripped it off. <laughs> I think it's a 75 movie. Uh, it stars William Shatner, and it's a s small town in Texas gets invaded by tarantulas. And uh, it wasn't bad. It has Shatner in it, of course. Uh, but they used real tarantulas, and they'd put like put them on his face and stuff, and he'd go, ah, must get spiders off my face. But then at the end of the movie – the townspeople struck back and they were grabbing these spiders or, and smashing them and stomping on them and, and oh, there's one of them and it smashed, squashed, hit, kill. And I was horrified. <laughs> they were killing these spiders. And I was like, whoa, whoa. And that took me out of the movie as much as a bad special effect did. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where it's just like, okay, this is the opposite end of the spectrum. You can't kill all these poor spiders. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, the change in society. I'm sure we've talked about that before. But I remember in a, uh, a film history class that we had, they put on a Jean Renoir movie. And uh, they showed these French guys, they went out hunting and they're out there shooting and you see birds come down to the ground dead and land on the ground with a flop. You know, the whole class is kind of freaking out as they see this stuff on film and, and the teacher's like, yes, animals were harmed in the making of this film. It's strange when you when you see something. Most films, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. The one thing that's going to come out and go, whoa, you know, crap, this is a different time and place. But uh, yeah, and now and then... You get a film like that. They're shooting all these birds and they were filming them die. And then that was our entertainment. Boy, I don't know. Well, back in like the old Cecil B. DeMille days or, or in the old Western days where they would just clothesline a horse <laughs> or they'd, you know, they'd I'd pull a rope from its front legs so it'd go tumble down and fall on its head or whatever. And those are really difficult to watch now yeah. because, you know, they really hurt an animal to yeah, do that. It's, it's hard to handle that kind of stuff. And you, you would think watching Kingdom of the Spiders – You'd be happy to see spiders getting squashed. I'm sure everybody else was, but... But when you realize that they're real spiders and that they're actors, it's not very fair. It's not like it's a spider that came into your house and hid behind your TV and was waiting to bite you and kill you. Right. These, these spiders were extras. That's and right. I've been an extra. I know how hard that is. It's not. How unsung that is. It's just not okay anymore, you know? We, we've learned. We've evolved. I guess there's products of the past that are going to be around. It's like reading a Dickens novel or something, you know. Things things happened in those that you don't understand anymore. I guess that's the way old films are too. It's, 
a little bit more shocking because film is something you're actually seeing happen, whereas just reading about something, it's, it's different. Well, I guess we should talk about Spider Hunt. I'm not really sure. I guess Giant Spiders is a roundabout way of talking about Spider Hunt. Because I love spiders, this story was right up my alley. I, I like the idea of a guy going out and doing battle with spiders in the, the forest uh, with giant spiders, giant venomous spiders in the mm-hmm. forest. And uh, yeah, it would be really fun to see this as a, a motion picture, but it would be difficult to make the spiders look real. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I, I fully expect the Hobbit spiders to look real, but maybe they don't have to because they're going to be talking spiders and all that and making a sort True. of cartoon them up a little bit, you know, to give them personalities, give Charlotte them up so that they have faces and, you know, things like that. Whereas uh, I would think if they made a movie of Spider Hunt, you would want these things to look exactly like a spider. Uh, the, the Shelob, as far as I know, was based on a spider that's native to New Zealand. It was something that we never see here, of course, but people there recognize it instantly. Holy cow. They all wet themselves as they were watching that movie. It's just like that spider I found behind my TV, but <laughs> big as a friggin' Volkswagen bus. <laughs> I remember when we first got this story sent to us, you were all excited and you were you were planning out how you would make these spiders sound. Mm. I'm not sure what Brian wound up using. He's doing a whole podcast about it on his full cast show. Isn't he going to do about how he got the sounds and how he put them together and what he did? I hope so. Yeah, we haven't mentioned his podcast, have we? Oh, yeah, we um, were going to. He's got the full cast podcast. And uh, it's just for audio dramas with a, a full cast, with a cast of voice actors. Right. It's kind of a how-to podcast, how, how to go about putting together full cast readings of, of stories and stuff like that. And the last episode he did for us was called Plague Birds. And he basically ran a promo at the beginning of the episode, and then he broke down every part of the promo, every aspect of the promo and how he made all the voices and how he did the sound effects. I I thought it was riveting. It was only like 22 minutes long, but if it had gone on an hour and 22 minutes, I wouldn't have complained. Just really, really interesting. Brian's one of those guys that doesn't just go to freesound.org or whatever and dig up a sound effect. He creates it himself. And because he's got a forum in this podcast, uh, I guess he has an audience of people that are like, wow, I had no idea you could do that with a banana. I never went to camp. Don't you dare go there. No, I, I had no idea you, know, you could create a sound like that. And I was pretty jealous when I found out Brian was going to be doing this episode because I wanted to come up with a sound for the giant spiders. Uh, this was another one of those that I read like in a restaurant. It was in Taco Bell or Del Taco or something like that. And I was just like, okay. Taco you know, time maybe. Something with taco, taco in it. Taco Amigo, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, okay, you know the sound that a raccoon makes where it goes, it's a chittering sound. But then if you startle a raccoon, it goes, ah, it hisses. And I thought, oh, okay, if we could do that sound and then lower the pitch, <laughs> it might sound like what a giant spider should sound like in my head. And do you remember what Abby Hilton said when we were talking about what, what would a giant spider sound like? I don't remember. What did she say? Oh, she said, <laughs> spiders don't make any sound. Sorry, that's in the text. And Grishnards don't make a sound either. <laughs> But what a giant spider sounds like in my head and what a giant spider sounds like in Brian's head may be totally different because we don't have giant spiders. Right. They don't exist. Yet. So you get to make up your own sound. Yeah, I remember when we were trying to look up, we were trying to find on free sound maybe uh, the sound of a chittering raccoon. And so we looked it up and came up with nothing. And then we looked spider and we found spider monkeys. And spider monkeys made this kind of screeching noise. I don't remember what it was like, but I remember thinking, oh, if you maybe lower the pitch on that and do this, you know, that that might work. And I think we even suggested it to Brian. But yeah, and he I, said, I, hell no, big <laughs> Anchorage. I think that uh, he's going to do the same thing that he did with Plague Birds for his show, but he was planning on doing a, a making of for Spider Hunt where he talks about how he made the sound effects to go along with the spiders. And so I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty interested to see how that comes out. Uh, that should be pretty cool. That's one of those interesting things that you, you run across when you're doing audio fiction of a speculative bent is that, yeah, you're going to have sounds that don't exist. What does a spaceship sound like uh, lifting off 
what does the ramp sound like when it lowers down from the spaceship to the ground or whatever? What is the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah, sometimes that. You know, I used a car window rolling down for the sound of the ramp coming down on uh, the Catastrophe Baker story. Oh. Because I needed something kind of... So, you know, I just found something that sounds like it. And I've done that a lot. Find something that is kind of what you would imagine. What would you do for the sounds of the scrabbling legs of a giant spider? You know, I might just make that sound effect myself. Sometimes some things are just hard to get. But if you put the mic in just on the table and maybe do a scratching or, or something like that, or maybe get a piece of paper or a cardboard or something that you can scratch against, um, a lot of that kind of stuff works really well. You know, you never know. Like the aliens on Catastrophe Baker. It's pasta being stirred with a spoon. You're the kidding. Alien going... <laughs> that kind of gross oh, sound cool. that's supposed to be the uh, tentacles or whatever of these things moving. We didn't ever talk about that because we recorded the episode weeks <laughs> before that sound was ever made. Right. Wow. But yeah, that kind of stuff is fun where you can, you know, and that's, I guess, the life of a, of a Foley guy is one of those people that just figures out you know there's a really interesting featurette on the wally disc that's all about ben burt and how he made the sound effects for, for wally and that's you know got to be even more difficult probably by a long ways than scoring a bit of audio fiction because unlike but that's his job. True. I'm not saying that it's something that he shouldn't have a hard time doing, but I'm just saying unlike a, a regular film that comes with a little bit of audio to begin with, he's got to create everything for that. But it just shows some of the interesting things that he does to like to make wind. Instead of going out and trying to record actual wind, he would get a big rug, roll it up, he'd get a mic by it, and he would drag it along on the carpet. And it would make a sound and that sounded more like wind than actual wind does you know and that kind of stuff and he he, he talks a lot about you know making thunder where you get the sheet of metal and you wiggle it around and it makes that sound that sounds like thunder and you know they show some of the people that did sounds for cartoons all the way back when you know mickey mouse was the number one cartoon in the land and they're showing them make the uh sound effects for those kind of things and and now here it is 70 years later and ben burt's doing the same kind of thing so you know it would be a fun occupation to have to be a foley guy well have you seen the footage of him back in 77 coming up with how this lightsaber was going to sound or there were these power line kind of thing and he would hit him with like a nail and it would and it would make a sound a sound that the blasters make and and all that it's just to me that is so fascinating i've heard him talk about that he would just go on hikes with his little portable recorder and any object that he found or whatever he would record it just to see what that might sound like and then you know he could play with it later because he had a synthesizer that i guess you could input these sounds into and stuff and, and yeah, it would be 10 years later and in an Indiana Jones film, they needed a sound. It's like, oh, hey, this sound that I discovered that day when there was a can with a string on it, you know, just <laughs> right. that kind of thing is so fascinating. And I guess he and Gary Rydstrom are the only sound engineers that I know the names of. And I'm sure 90% of the people out there listening to this don't know who either of those guys are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just that's a real talent and a real difficult task i guess and it makes me want to go over there and see if brian has uploaded the episode yet (laughs) find out what he did it's a lot of fun that's one of the cool things that we get to do as uh the producers of audio fiction stories uh last week when we were recording that kind of gives you an idea of, of when we're recording this episode and when things came out but last week we were just about to put out catastrophe baker as the episode and i needed a blaster being dropped onto the ground i needed the sound effect of that and so rish and i looked around and we tried to find something that would work and we wound up settling on a wrench so we got out the recording equipment started it recording and dropped the wrench onto the table a bunch of times and i used the best sound effect of that for that show and it's really fun stuff that you can do until your wife discovered the dents on the table <laughs> it's one of the, the great things that i like about this show is being able to put together a soundscape with a story. 
and I'm sure all of our various producers that are joining the fray, they're they're now getting their chance to do the same to really enjoy making a soundscape to go along with the story. Well, there's that website. I think we've mentioned it like 90 times, the Free Sound Project or whatever mm-hmm. it's called. And I guess you can record something and then upload it. When we were looking for spider, there were actually a couple of entries that were supposed to be the sound of spiders. Mm -hmm. And I guess somebody just tapped on their microphone and called that a spider. But you could make the sound of of the wind and then upload it. And strangers that you'll never know use it on their birthday video or their Halloween YouTube horror film or, or whatever it might be. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it is cool. The world is small. Yeah, to share things. There's communities of all sorts of uh, ilks out there, be it a community of podcasters or a community of folks that like to make sounds. And they have forums and stuff like that on the freesound.org, and you can get on there and request a sound from people. A lot of times I'll search for sounds and it'll say, Someone requested this sound, so here it is. And that's always cool. There's tons of great sound effects uh, available for, for use on that website. I really like that one a lot. There's a million and one things that you could do as a creative outlet. Do you ever wonder what you would do if we didn't do this show? <laughs> Maybe I would write. <laughs> I know that I would definitely be doing something. I think I said that to my wife um, after I'd started the show and worked on it and, you know, done it for a while and was talking about how much time that it uses up and stuff like that. And I I was just thinking, you know, it's just something that I'm going to do. You know, I'm just that kind of a person that I'm not going to be happy and satisfied unless I'm doing something creative. So if I'm not doing this show, then I'll do something else. I don't know what it'll be. Uploading sound effects to freesound.org. Yeah, maybe maybe I would be writing stories or maybe I would be uh, trying to make movies with my kids as the lead actors. You used to do that a lot and I would always be so jealous because I was never a part of any of those things. And people are always doing auditions for voice work, uh, you know, for for audio Mm -hmm. dramas and, and things like that. Oh, there's so many of them and I'd like to be able to audition for all of them, but I can't. I, I, you know, I've got too much stuff going on and you, I watch people on YouTube and they've made a, a YouTube video of them singing the Lionel Richie part of Endless Love or whatever and some girl out there can do the Diana Ross thing. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> but I don't. I, I have other things that I, I do or that I've you chosen to do. You want to do the do. Diana Ross part really bad? My love, my love, my endless love. Well, my friends listen to Endless Love in the Dark. <laughs> and there's just so many things. that I, Oh, yeah, like cartoons and stuff like that. When I was a young man, a young man, when I was, we've both done it now. When I was a kid, I thought it would be so great to have one of those cameras that had a single frame option and to be able to do animation. And, and I didn't. But I would try and do it with the camcorder and, oh gosh, what a (laughs) giant waste of hours and hours and hours and hours trying to animate things. Yeah, that's something that I think about still. I know that there are animation programs that you can buy for your computer and I'm like, oh, I got to get this and I'll start making cartoons and stuff. But not enough hours in the day. (laughs) Fortunately, that's true. There'd be 50 hours in a day. There still wouldn't be enough hours in the day. When I was a young man, wait... I mean, a child. I had a friend who had a Super 8 camera that had the uh, single frame option, and we used to animate G.I. Joes running around and shooting their guns at each other, and we'd tape a match onto their gun and light the match and snap quick like three frames or whatever to get the gun shooting, which unfortunately ruined an awful lot of guns because it would kind of melt the plastic on the gun. Mm. But but yeah, we made uh, our, a fair number of those kind of things um, with one of those... Uh, eight millimeter cameras we really enjoyed that unfortunately even way back then it cost an arm and a leg to get the freaking film developed oh i forgot because it was so hard to find nobody used it anymore you know they had real they had camcorders so (laughs) people didn't use super 8 anymore and yeah it was it was very difficult to uh, to get that so mostly my friend who actually had money whereas i didn't would was the one that would buy the film and get the film developed and so it was only when he had film that we ever did any of it 
that's fun. That's cool stuff too. There's a lot of different things out there that you can do. And I think this day and age, you, you speak of YouTube. That's just an amazingly cool thing. Can you imagine? Even just when we were in college, if YouTube had existed and been, you know, as prolific as it is now, what we would have done? I mean, we started like a a freaking film society so that we would have an audience to show the films that we made to people. Can you imagine if we could just throw it on the freaking internet and a million people decide to check it out? Oh, you and I would have a show like this in college on YouTube. And I think, yeah, there were so many times when I would be writing a script and I would either give up or I would finish it and I'd be like, woohoo, I finished this. Now what? <laughs> I'm never going to be able to make it because a lot of the, the, the mindset was make it if it's for a class or make it if you can make money from it. Ne'er the twain shall meet. Yeah, make it at least if you had some somewhere to show it. But otherwise, who cares? Give up. Kill yourself now. And I wish that I had. <laughs> yeah, I'm so jealous of the, the YouTube generation and the people that have this computer that you're recording on right now has a camera built into it. Wow. Yeah, you see a lot of videos made that way. <laughs> you do, but some of these people that just turn on their iMac in their room – and they talk about a movie or that they just went and saw or they deconstruct a pop song or they you know, do a commentary for a, an episode of television or whatever. And thousands of people follow that. Thousands of fans it's true. just look forward to it. You know, there are people that that's what they make their living from is just doing YouTube videos or, or they have a website where they – you know, they used to do it on YouTube for free and now they're paid to do it because they have a following of people that will click on the ads and then, that, that just amazes me. And it, it also – it makes me feel bad but it makes me feel like, oh, I could do that. I could do better than that. You know what I mean? It yeah. just Do you remember when we uh, actually considered doing a video episode of the show? I do because we talked about it in our last episode. Did we really? I was editing it today. Oh, how about that? The final episode. Yeah, th th that could be interesting. We may have to still try that sometime. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to do a That Gets My Goat where it's just you and me and I, I guess we would be talking via Skype so that there's a camera on me and a camera on you and we can cut back and forth and – that we were going to have a, a bunch of visuals, uh, whoever we happened to be talking about. Uh -huh. I said, could could if I sent you a bunch of JPEGs, could you put that face on there or have a picture? And you're like, yeah, of course. And I was like, oh, we are so doing this. <laughs> and yet I don't think we ever mentioned it again. Well, we should. We should do it. That would be fun. We could become YouTube stars. We could make our living on YouTube. <laughs> there are people that make so much money. I, I, I remember – Around the time that we first started this podcast, you told me about a woman that was interviewed on the news that she had a blog uh -huh. and she made her living from the blog. Made, Thousands of people yeah. read her blog every day or she every She made whenever. more than just her living. And she made a handsome living. She, she owned was her making, own home. I understand. She was making like my yearly income <laughs> per month just by doing this blog. That was what inspired me to, you know what, maybe I ought to give this thing a try. And, you know, I probably shouldn't have, but it's too late now. <laughs> maybe we should get a Dune Steve YouTube channel and what we can else? throw crap like that on there <laughs> for yeah. fun. Uh, well, maybe we should ask the listener if he or she would be interested in us doing a, a visual episode and just putting it up on YouTube. I know you've got a YouTube page and I do too. I can't think of what I might have uploaded there, but. That would be an interesting experiment, at it least. It would be fun. Uh, but we've got these friends, uh, Rich and Juliet, that do puppet show. Not pu uh, like what, – what would you call what they do? I would call it a puppet show. Like, I don't know. Like short good. films with Muppets. How's right. That? They're like Muppets. And they upload those things. And yeah, I have no idea how many viewers they've got. But it's got to be – Probably ten times what we get. Yeah, on our I was going to say it's got to be more than us. Um, but yeah, just, just because the, you can see it, that many people more will, will care. It's something you and I talk about with writing all the time: is that people become writers because something they read really inspires them, or because they read something and they say, "I could do better than that." Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of the. Shit on YouTube, I see it and go, oh, geez, I could have done better than that when I was 11 years old. 
why wasn't there a YouTube then? <laughs> but, you know. But, yeah, it would be easy enough. All that stuff is pretty simple. I do that stuff for a living when it comes down to it. So we could throw something together real easy if you wanted to. I sort of do. <laughs> well, I don't know. Thanks to people like Brian, we have lots of free time not taken up by the show. So maybe we can do something like that. Yeah, there you go. We've certainly done an extraordinarily long episode for Spider Hunt in which we talked very little about Spider Hunt. Well, we talked about spiders. That's good, right? Not on your life. Yeah, so if you're interested, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Would it be fun to see? Would you care? We've probably talked long enough. We, I think we should let everyone go their merry way and uh, continue with their worthwhile lives. I agree. So thanks for listening, folks, and we'll see you again next week. Really? Yeah. Them's bold words. <laughs> I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rish Outfield. Bye. At the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. The Dune Steve audio fiction magazine does not cause hearing loss, but sometimes it does make it seem like an option worth considering. Take two. He watched closely as a yellow tit on the edge of the flock glided too wide on its... Tit is just a How funny word. you not laugh at this? It's too hard to even sit here and listen to you read it. The web held the tit firm. Like a push-up bra. It flared its... Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you know, that was uncalled for. That's the last tit reference we will make, except for this one. Go. Tits. Cheer up, Brian. Gotta look on the bright side of life. Some things in life are bad. All right, Spider Bunt. Spider Bunt. <laughs> Sing it! Spider Bunt. Spider Bunt. Does whatever a spider can't do. Oh, it's genius. <laughs> Problem is, now we're going to have to do the whole thing in this voice. Spider Bunt by Kenneth, you must be joking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm American. I've got no culture at all. I'm giving it all she's got, Captain. Kenneth, yeah. All right, sir. But seriously. You know, if you finish this quickly, we can watch Castle. If you don't, it's out. <laughs> Here, his wife says that to him all the time. I can't say hunt. If you can get past the title, then it would be good. It's really difficult. I am American and I don't have culture. <laughs> you did it. You made it. Now you just have to get past Kenneth Yu and you're home free. By Kenneth Yu. Ah, oh, you blew it. I had the chance to be a real podcaster. You blew it. Blew it! I didn't do nothing. Oh, Brian, why are we even sending you this file? <laughs> this is just 25 minutes of us not even getting past the first sentence. <laughs> Layton. Layton? That's what I would say. Layton. Do you pronounce the T? Layton? Yeah, late. Mm. I said Layton. There's no T at all. Well, then say the T. Layton. I'm hearing a T when you say it. Layton. Late? Mm. Thank Layton. you. Wait. Layton. So. Layton, still a stone, pressed back against the tree trunk and squinted. The rising sun shimmering through gray cloud wrapped mountains on the horizon on an expanded line of light against the Okay, let's go. You're so gay and you don't even like your boys. Yes. You know, I actually like that song. Yeah, I've that to me. I don't have it anymore. My wife deleted it because it was too naughty and bawdy. Oh, it was bawdy. <laughs> Ripple <laughs> Layton, still as stone, pressed back against the tree trunk. <laughs> I try to obey, but it is difficult. <clears throat>
Wait, it's Shiva, let me die. But I do not. Now the evil of Kali take me. Sleep. Fatness. <sighs> Poor Brian's life is just tick-tocking away. Yeah, we're like four minutes into this file and you still haven't done the first sentence yet. Uh, you, oh, he thought I was joking? No, it is 25 minutes of us pissing in the wind, sir. <clears throat> and he still wants us as a guest on his show. <laughs> what a silly bunt. You have no idea. Leighton, still as stone, pressed back against the tree trunk. Not minding the crystalline dewdrops dangling on his dong. I would say crystalline. Is it crystalline or crystalline, you think? Crystalline. Crystalis. I guess it could be crystalline if you were from Britain. Why can't I be from Britain? We don't have a culture here. Oh, I'm so, uh, Brian, drinking game. Every time I mention that Americans have no culture, you have to drink. And if uh, we say, what a silly bunt, you have to take an entire swig. I forgot about that. We're, maybe we'll just email him the instructions at the beginning. Yeah. I'm going to say crystalline. I'm sorry. You say whichever one you like, I guess. Well, um, <clears throat> the planet that data came from was destroyed by the crystalline entity, I believe. Ooh. Or maybe it was a crystalline entity. Damn it. You're so gay and you don't even like boys. <laughs> from that tree came a rustle of leaves, and in a burst and a scatter, a flock of blue and yellow tits launched themselves in flight. Why are the tits blue and yellow? Has someone been beating on these poor tits? You have no idea. <laughs> do, do I need to say that sentence again? I didn't pronounce the T in Russell. Rustle. Wait, you don't pronounce the T. You can't be serious, can you? You you try and put the T in often, too, and say often. There is a T in often. Yeah, there's one in Russell as well. You've heard of silent letters before, right? There's a GH in night as well. Yeah. And I don't want to hear you saying, there's a GH, so you say negatively. You know, there's a silent PH in FU, too. Yeah, good. The web held the tit firm like a push-up bra. It flared its... Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you know, that was uncalled for. That's the last tit reference we will make, except for this one. Go. Tits. Okay, so we've made a rule, no more? Well, there may be a few more. We'll see. Okay. The web held the tit firm. That's not even funny, man. <laughs> I never, never it thought, it would, tit firm. Never thought Come I'd be on. jealous of a web before. How can that not be funny? Lots of tits, anyways. <sighs> a whole flock of tits. Brian has a gun in his mouth as we speak. <laughs> <clears throat> Playing Russian roulette by himself. <laughs> That's his new drinking game. Instead, every time you say Britain ha or America has no culture, he pulls the trigger. Okay, go. The web held the tit firm. <laughs> I didn't do nothing! <laughs> okay, go. The web held Raquel Welch's massive tits firm. <laughs> that was a really hard word. I'm in a sentence to get that. Speaking of hard. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. We're almost past this whole bit. The bird is almost dead. As is Brian. <laughs> Eddie? Just pulled the trigger one more time. <laughs> and then he got lucky again. America has no <laughs> <clears throat> koala bears. The web held the bosom firm. I'm sorry, he took a drink and I was hoping it would get some kind I of reaction. I didn't take a drink because I knew that I <laughs> laugh when you were at. I had to take All right. the bottle away, stepped off of the ledge. Catching it whole, encompassing, encompassing. Mm, damn, it went up. How do you say encompassing it? You don't say the G a bunch of times. You say encompassing. Because look, the next sentence has nudge and cock. Do you think <laughs> he might know what he's doing here? Nudge, nudge. Know what I mean? Wrapped at last, the tit still tried to fight back, but could only nudge half a wing and cock its head. <laughs> I got a sentence that has tit, nudge, and cock all in the same sentence. And frantically from side to side. <laughs> I like the Ewoks. I just wanted to get that out there. And this, the final episode Brian ever helps us with, Spider Bunt. 
Now you can make the tick, tick, tick sound if you want to. Okay. So let it be wet. And Ooh. Okay, tell me more. Now, Leighton thought, before the spider can lay a claw on the tit. <laughs> <laughs> Once the hole was large enough, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> it makes me wonder if maybe he just set out to write a story with a whole bunch of dirty words just slipped in there here and there. And he put a list of them and is like, okay, you got to use all these words. And he's going through checking them off. Cock. Got it. Yes, it. Got it. Hustler had its very first fiction contest, Hustler magazine. <laughs> and they had all these words that you had to, to write. Flock of tits. Much better than a flock of seagulls. Say it how you want. If you got to go back. It is Liesel, right? Liesel, yes. Okay. Um, so long. Farewell. I'll be the Zena Jew. Which Liesel. do you think would be funnier to a child? Tit mouse or Lake Titicaca? <laughs> Titicaca. Okay. I always liked that a lot. Am I late as well? Yes, you are late. Brian, you think too much of me. Oh, I farted. Would my father and mother stay faithful to such a merciless church? Sorry, family. Elia perceived his suffering and softened her voice. So you said it again. Sorry, that's how I narrate. That's why we don't have a parsec, I guess. I guess, yeah. They're listening to the no, the one that was nominated. Did he just say softened? <sighs> what a douche. No, Next. He was not attuned to the idleness of prayer, but his spirit pricked up at the hint of Picked. some... No prick. You expected it to be the dirty word. It's always the dirty word, but for once this time it's not. A young one, black and hairy. Mm-hmm. Sorry. A young one, black and hairy, almost a foot long. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do nothing! <laughs> She showed him how to spread the jaw bones wide, how to... Ex he worked spread in there, too. <laughs> bones as well. She showed him how to spread the jaw bones wide, how to extract the venom sac from within the head. <laughs> from it, she brought forth a skin-lined box. She... <laughs> It's weird. Once you look for it, it's everywhere. Holy cow. Uh, mm. Tried to fight it, but his arm had already stiffened. But his arm had already stiffened. Stiffened. You're putting a T in there like often. The veins in it bulging, throbbing, becoming an ugly, angry purple. <laughs> Please, Father, take this sex. To my sister, heal her, and if you refuse, take them to Ilya, who doesn't fucking suck as much as you do. Hope that's all right. Okay, well, let's see how carrots. long we've recorded for poor Brian. An hour and 18 minutes. Yowza! Only 18 of those minutes are useful. <laughs> I wish that, like, Father Harold... <laughs> Father Harold, why didn't you just fucking name him that? You do not believe in the gods. After what happened to your parents, I cannot blame you. Why are you laughing? The chest is crying in the background. I know. You're like the old cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Author's note. I wrote Spider Bunt. And in addition to being on our show, he has another podcast at, hold on a minute here. Mabuti! Pakingan Pilipinas, which I'm guessing is a Filipino podcast. I, uh, I'm i not sure. And then he... Wait, wait. Has, what? Did it have penis in the... Pilipinas. That still sounds like you're saying penis. Pilipinas. Ah. Okay, hold on one second. Mabuti! You are. Mm -hmm. So you shall read the author's note. Mabuti. Mabuti. Author's note. I wrote Spider Hunt on a dare from another writer friend. I, I, I knew it! 
You wrote it on a dare. What's the biggest spider you've ever seen? Because you've been to the rainforest, right? I'm farting. I'm sorry. There was somebody who claimed he was bit by a brown recluse, and they went and talked to a spider. And scrotum swelled up like a. F- you know what we also also ought to do sometime is just take some of those goofy old movies that we did in college and put them on YouTube. I know that some stuff that we've done in college is on YouTube. You can find it if you look hard enough. Oh, really? Uh, for example, I pressed the button. Came from a student film that we did in college, and I f- don't have a copy of that film because someone else actually was the director, and and uh, all I did was edit it. But I found that on YouTube. That's where I got the uh, the sound bite for it to use on the show in the first place. Um, so they're they're out there. But yeah, maybe we ought to just try that. That would be interesting to throw some of our our old films that we've put together. We people could see us trying to act. Oh, they could see how bad my acting was back then, too. It's so much easier to act when people can't see you. <laughs> That's something that you said last week when you had to cry. You said, oh, boy, it's so much easier. And you know what it is. I didn't it's have so to have much real easier tears. to just do fear or to do uh, grief or happiness in the voice. Um, but, you know, it's a different art. Yeah. To, to make your voice sound like something uh, than just acting. Uh, and acting for cinema or acting for theater is very different. Right. Acting for silent film versus film <laughs> with sound. You know, you get those people that were huge deals in silent film and then suddenly sound came along and they couldn't do it. it like you saw in uh, Singing in the Rain where the girl's just got the most hideous voice in the world. She's great in silent film, but all of a sudden you can hear her voice and you're like, oh, I can't stand him. That's true. <laughs> 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 <laughs>